Jen A. Jenkins. I'm your new local election supervisor for KPFA. Are you interested in making a difference in your community? Do you want to get more involved with KPFA radio? There is no time like the present. KPFA is having elections for its board of directors this fall, and several seats are available for listener representatives. The nomination period will be open until September 25th. If you or someone you know is interested in KPFA's board, please visit kpfa.org or feel free to call 510-848-6767, extension 266. That's 510-848-6767, extension 266. You may also email us at elections at kpfa.org. With independent media, we can change the world. And you are listening to 94.1 KPFA in Berkeley, 89.3 KPFB in Berkeley, 88.1 KFCF in Fresno, and online at kpfa.org. The time is a minute past 1 p.m. Stay tuned next for Terra Verde. From the Amazon Basin, from the magnificent redwoods of California to the icy majesty of the Arctic, life on Earth faces an unprecedented threat from careless development. Join Terra Verde over lunch today to find out about the unfolding future of the planet. And welcome to Terra Verde, a weekly environmental radio show on KPFA or KPFB in Berkeley or KFCF in Fresno. My name is Carolo Aparicio, and I will be your host on today's show. Today I'm going to speak with Keisha Evans and Miriam Cruz, two community organizers from East Palo Alto who helped organize their community to kick out an industrial polluter. Uh, welcome to the show. Thank you. The the story that, that both of you tell about kicking out this industrial polluter is really, really fascinating. But before we really get into um, into the heart of that story about how people came together to pressure this industrial polluter out of your community. I'd like our listening audience to um, get to know the two of you a little bit better. Miriam, what, why don't we start with you? Um, can you tell us a little bit about yourself? Well, I'm 18 years old, and I started uh, working with YUCA, Youth United for Community Action, when I was 16. And right now I'm in Community School South. Um, and I'm planning on going to college and be a cosmetologist. Great. And Keisha, um, maybe you can introduce yourself to oh. our listening audience. Yeah, my name is Keisha Evans, and I've lived in East Palo Alto for about 35 years. And um, uh, right now I'm a business owner, but I also was a teacher in the community. Uh, we raised our children there. My husband, uh, Peter Evans, um, is on the city council right now, and he's been also a longtime activist. And um, it's just a pleasure to be on your show today. Well, thank you. It's, it's a pleasure to have you on the show. So, Miriam, can you tell us a little bit about what East Palo Alto is like? Well, we have a lot of um, environmental, uh, environmental racists, and mm. we, have, we are a low-income community, and it, there's a lot of minorities. Um, Keisha, what are what are some of the communities that are represented in East Palo Alto, and or, or if you have anything else to add to um, Miriam's comments? Yeah, I would add um, also that um, we do have um, environmental uh, problems in East Palo Alto, but we are blessed to have a number of people in our community who are focused and willing to work. We have, um, you name it. Uh, as far as ethnicities, and we have it in East Palo Alto, African American, um, various country, Latino countries, Mexico, Guatemala, El Salvador, Honduras, uh, Costa Rica. Um, we have the South Indian community. We have um, a large po- Polynesian community from Samoa, Tonga, and we're, we're united in we love our community and we want the best for our community. Oh, that's a really very diverse sort of, you know, global village or something that that you've got going on in in East Palo Alto. Um, Miriam, I, I want to turn to um, the a little bit more on on your story now, 
And according to the press release from your organization, Youth United for Community Action, the organization's been working for 14 years to uh, shut down this toxic waste recycling facility over in East Palo Alto. And just last month, the plant shut down. Well, first of all, let's start with what, what was the problem with the plant? Well, the problem with this plant is that it didn't have a permit. It doesn't have a permit to be operating, and it also had a lot of worker injuries, and um, it had a chemical release on June 5 of 2006. Am I right, Keisha? Yeah, right. Yeah. And basically this this agent, I mean, this um, facility did not follow orders and stuff, so Mm -hmm. we were trying to shut it down because we believe this is a major... um, uh, it, uh, East Palo Alto has the highest and asthma and cancer rates, and we believe this this facility contributed a lot right, to it. Right. So that's why we basically wanted to shut it down. And, and Carola, we, we also want the audience to know that a toxic waste recycler brings into our community a lot of hazardous waste that are processed, recycled, transported, stored, all kinds of things. And we felt we have felt that the high incidence of cancer and also the high incidence of asthma in our community, especially among young children, is is a part of uh, is what they are partially responsible for. Yeah. Um, Keisha, do you do you have any um, any numbers on that? Like what the what the cancer rates or asthma rate compared to other communities around the Bay Area? I don't have them uh, with me, but uh, Yuka um, actually did a a, a study. And came up with an excellent report, and um, I'm sure they, that anybody who wants to get a copy of that report can get it through uh, Yuka. Okay, and um, at the end of the at the end of the program, I'll um, give you the web address right. for um, for Youth United for Community Action. Correct. And um, so, can you um, describe in a little bit greater detail as to what the uh, what activities were going on in in that plant? I mean, you mentioned chemical recycling, and what what were some of the dangerous processes that, that were going on there? Okay, well, what Silicon Valley um, has to have a place to, um, to uh, deposit their waste, as well as other places. So um, hazardous material was brought into East Palo Alto in tanker trucks or in drums and uh, were processed on site. Um, Miriam mentioned that um, one of the problems um, that Romic, this company, was having was worker injuries because they didn't follow all the uh, OSHA guidelines. So we had somebody who was uh, permanently brain damaged as a result of being ill-prepared to do the, to, to do the task. There were what we call fugitives. That means um, um, uh, air air issues. There was groundwater issues, all because of the processing um, of these chemicals, as well as storing. Now, last year, what Miriam was uh, referring to was they uh, mixed the wrong chemicals together, and it exploded. And it covered a whole area, um, and you could see where the uh, residue landed. And people live like my house is less than a mile away from this facility. Well, did were you were you home at the time that that happened, and did you suffer any sort of did, did anything of happen people, to you? A lots of people were not able to felt it and, and were not able to breathe. Um, fortunately, we didn't um, get that um, that physical reaction. But unfortunately, with this kind of thing, you don't know um, in the long run what the effects are. Um, there was a, um, uh, what do they call it, a, 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 a shelter-in-place order. People were supposed to stay inside for a period of time, and they went around with bullhorns announcing it. But um, we felt, and we still continue to feel, that we have been at grave um, risk because of the presence of that facility um, in the community and also the lack of oversight, which is another part of this discussion by the agency, the the official agencies that were supposed to be regulating what was happening there. Well, who was supposed to be monitoring what was what was going on there? What what agencies were? were... Okay, there is um, 
uh, an, the Environmental Protection Agency has two parts. There's the U- U.S. Environmental Protection Agency, and then there is the California Environmental Protection Agency um, that we call EPA. So if I say EPA, we're talking about the California Environmental Protection Agency, under which there is a Department of Toxic Substance Control called DTSC. They have direct... Um, permitting and regulation powers over a facility such as this. Local people don't, uh, you know, the local um, authorities do not control environmental, I mean, hazardous waste uh, places in your community. And uh, in 1989, this facility came to the, to the uh, city of East Palo Alto for a building permit to expand. No one at that time even realized what they were doing down there. Mm. And so um, uh, a number of us, Charles Brewer, Hamad Kareem, Peter Evans, Nozipo Wavogo, all started pushing the city not to permit them unless we knew what was going on down there. A lot of work went on, and finally our community leaders did not listen to the community, even though we had lots of signatures. Many people signed a petition, and they went ahead and allowed them to um, expand. And so uh, we went to court. We sued uh, Romick and the city. We were our own attorneys. It's called in pro per to get them to do an environmental impact study under the Cal California Environmental Quality Act. Well, before we get a little bit deeper into what your um, campaign activities were, um, Keisha, I'm just wondering, and I'm going to ask you too, Miriam, but Keisha, how did you get involved in this campaign? Well, we we almost started it. The people I'm talking about, um, when we realized what was going on, we started asking questions, we started talking, and someone uh, who felt that we were uh, not going to use it gave us the handbook uh, on the environmental, on the uh, um, uh, uh, CEQA, on the California Environmental Quality Act. And we, being readers, read the book, and we realized that they were supposed to do a whole environmental impact report. So we started working from there, and our numbers grew and grew. And, Miriam, how did, how did you get involved in this movement to... Um to boot out this industrial pollu- what you're calling an industrial polluter? Uh, well, first I became a volunteer, and I was just going to do my volunteer hours here, and I was going to be, like, gone. But then I got interested, and I wanted to make a change in my community, so I decided to stay and to make a change in my community. Um, who did you volunteer through? Um, I had probation, so I was volunteering to finish my hours here. And in, in the work that you were that you were doing, you found... You became excited in, in, uh, yeah, in the Yeah, I'm very excited. I feel like a total new person, and I feel like I'm making a change. Wow, and that's... I, might, I might add a very effective worker. <laughs> <laughs> very effective. <laughs> so th- this has been a 14-year struggle. So at the at the beginning of this struggle, Miriam, you would have been, what, three? Yeah. <laughs> and um, so it's been a, a long, sustained campaign. Now, the company... According to according to them, they just packed up and left because of a business decision. Mm. Um, Keisha, you who have been there from the the start of the struggle, um, how would you respond to that? Well, um, one important thing to remember is that a lot of people were involved, and um, there was a lot of work that went on. In uh, when Yuka became the the kind of the lead fighters. They became, and, and the reason I wanted to point out what an um, outstanding worker um, Miriam is, Miriam has a lot of colleagues, young people who are, some of them starting as young as 12 and 13, who also pushed this whole um, getting a permit, Remember, they've been operating without a, 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 a permit. They've been on a temporary permit for all these years. And they, it took them from 1995 till now, and still we haven't had a final uh, environmental impact report, EIR. So that kind of work um, has been pushing this whole thing. Finally, also apparently they weren't making very much money, but last year... 
several companies and some of the cities decided they didn't want to use Romic anymore because of the impact it was having on our community. So from the work that all of us were doing and, and the great publicity that was finally being slowly given to this problem, uh, local industries were saying, we're going to send our, our, our stuff someplace else because it's impacting the residents of East Palo Alto too, too greatly. Can you measure how many companies left because of what, the work? It's very difficult. Keisha, I'm going to have to do a station ID right now. And okay. Uh, okay, this is Carolo Aparicio, and you're tuned to Terra Verde, a weekly environmental radio show on KPFA and KPFB in Berkeley and KFCF in Fresno. Um, I apologize for having interrupted you. Please go on. That's okay. That's okay. Primarily, I was saying that the work that has been done, um, we cannot measure how many companies did not started to send their waste someplace else other than East Palo Alto, and how many companies started looked at looking at what we really think is important, and that is source reduction, not having so much stuff to send any place, because after all, we really don't want to have this stuff sent to another low-income community. We want it taken care of on site as much as possible. And maybe we can also talk a little bit about source production in um, in just a little a little while and the impact of the of the campaign. Uh, but Miriam, I'm just wondering throughout the whole course of the organizing activities, I know that it was a multi multi generational, multi racial effort. Um, what was your role in getting more young people involved in this? Well, I started uh, reaching out to my my fellow workers and my friends. Um, I started telling them that what was going on, that we had a, a toxic waste facility in East Palo Alto, and that myself and my workers were trying to um, make a change in East Palo Alto. And so some of my friends got involved in Yucca, and that's how it happened. Um, could you describe some of the organizing activities that you did? I mean, you talked about outreach. What what did that look like? I mean, where... We go door to door to um, inform and um, educate our residents here in East Palo Alto and telling them what's going on. Great. And um, Keisha, what were, um, like I, I mentioned, this this being a multi-generational effort also, what were, what were some of the challenges in, um, what were some of the organizing challenges in uh, working with, with people who were just so different from each other? What, what did this organizing effort look like? Well, I think um, the outside community emphasizes the differences uh, of people as, um, ethnically more than we do. When we have a task like this to do, it doesn't matter if another person next to you uh, doesn't have the same ethnicity. What matters is the task and everybody coming together on it because there are lots of levels that you can work and there are lots of um, ways that people could input. So... Uh, I don't think we've had a problem with intergenerational or inter-ethnic uh, uh, at all because we had a task to do. The biggest problem we had was the number of uh, city officials who never got behind our effort. We never were able to say the city council wants to do X, Y, and Z. It's always been the, the community. Yuka has done it. Ujima has done it. All of the people who, who came to help, the people who signed petitions, the people who made phone calls, we never could say that any of our city leaders, except for Peter Evans, was totally behind our effort. We, even when the, 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 um, uh, Romick agreed to get the, the, um, environmental impact report. The city wouldn't even be the lead agency. That's how come Department of Toxic Substance Control became the lead agency. Because the city of East Palo Alto leaders said, nah, we, we, they're, they're into this can't, won't sit, hold syndrome. So that, that was really a problem, but, you know, the power of the people reigned in this situation. Even though the leaders weren't on board, um, the people continued working, and we had this wonderful, energetic, correct group of young people called Yuka Youth United Community uh, Youth United Com for Community Action that that stayed on the case. It, you can't give this credit to our our community leadership. It belongs squarely on the shoulders of the people who worked, and Yuka out in front. 
Now, a little while ago, you, um, you were starting to talk about this effort in a, in a broader, even national and, and global context, um, about how you managed to kick out a company from, from your community. Um, and you started talking about how, you know, there's always a possibility of a company setting up somewhere else or, you know, what about the scenario of leaving the country right. and going to some other place right. that has even less environmental regulations? Right. So my question is, you know, how, how is this campaign different from campaigns that have, have been criticized as being, you know, kind of not in my backyard type campaigns? Well, I think, as I said, number one, it's been a long campaign. And lots of people have been involved, and lots of work has been done. That has not been lost on the surrounding community, and particularly when when we first, uh, um, in 1995, uh, after the lawsuit, um, Romick agreed to ha- to do an environmental impact report, and they paid our lawyer too, by the way. And there was a scoping meeting, and the scoping meeting was to figure out how wide a scope this environmental impact report should could should cover. At that time, um, a lot of community agencies kept, rushed into the scoping meeting, and there were meetings held with a lot of organizations that do environmental justice work. As a matter of fact, that's when UCA got involved. And so as a result of all of those folks, we have, um, uh, what should I say, friends in high places? <laughs> we have a lot of organizations. They spread the word. The, the, the work that has been done hasn't been secret. And so, but how do I measure how much of, of an impact this had on companies not sending their waste to East Palo Alto? I really, I just don't know. And um, a little while ago, you also mentioned something about this campaign having an impact on uh, just even the source production of some of these harmful chemicals. Can you go a little bit deeper on on what you meant by that? Um, We live in a world where uh, there are so many creature comforts in this country, and one of the prices of all of those uh, creature comforts are in the manufacturing process. There are lots of side um, um, uh, things that are are generated that have to be quote unquote thrown away. Well, we know nothing is really thrown away. It's moved from one place to another, or it's changed its form. And so we have large number, large amounts of things that somebody has to do something with. What is the ideal is on site. They do something with them there, and that is either change it to a a form that is able to be used um, in a productive way or not generate as much or change their manufacturing um, um, formulas so that they're not even creating a lot of waste. But anyway, at the source, reducing the waste. And that's what is so important and so needed. And you mentioned that there that some of the companies were starting to do that. Um, yes, I don't have the statistics on on who they were or how many, but I do know in the last few years, Romic has been suffering economically. Uh, their business has gone down. And in part because companies were were pulling out because they just didn't I, want to I'd do like business to with that. Them? I like to think that, but I can't confirm it. Okay. Um Miriam, in uh in the course of your organizing activities, um what did what did you learn? I mean, this was this was a very successful campaign. Well, I learned a lot of things. Like I said earlier, um I'm to- I'm totally a different person right now. I before I used to have a lot of um stage fright. Right now I can go in front of a lot of people and speak out of confidence. I can talk to strangers. I can have a full conversation with um agencies and I don't know it's just been a wonderful experience to me and what about some of the other youth that participated in this um, what what sort of skills did did they come away with boy well <laughs> there's been everyone has their little like I don't know it's everyone put effort into it there's been people that have put art into it there's been people that put their passion, um, I don't know, public speaking skills. Uh, others done um, flyers. Writing. 
Yeah, yeah um, writing, lots of writing. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, it's been a lot. So, Keisha, what I'm wondering is, now that Romic seems to have um, pulled up stakes from East Palo Alto, what's what's next? Well, it's... Uh, what's the saying? It ain't over till it's over. They have to complete a closure plan. Um, there's um, now we we've had from uh, 1995 to the present with D, DTSC overseeing their permitting process. I'm sorry. What's the DTSC again? Department of Toxic Substance Control of California Environmental Protection Agency. Okay. Um, but DTSC is overseeing their closure plan. So we have to stay vigilant to be sure this is done and done correctly. Additionally, there's a whole land use issue. And that, as you know, is very important, particularly because we have uh, limited land. And instead of uh, having a lot of um, uh, commercial um Business, commercial uh, businesses in East Palo Alto, um, our, our developers seem to have um, captured the attention of our city officials and are building houses, houses, houses. So we have to be very vigilant that we have some commercial development in our city. We all recognize we have to have housing and, and, and affordable housing. So that is one issue. But the other issue is we have to have a commer- commercial base somewhere. So this, this piece of land that they are on um, offers us an opportunity in the redevelopment aid, um, area to have some com- commercial development. So we have to stay on it, and we also, but first we have to be sure that the closure plan is done and done correctly, that the land is remediated. So we have to be watchdogs. Well, I wanted to ask you just really, really quickly because we're running out of time. Um, what are some of the elements that would go into a, a good closure plan? Um, well, right now there's the um, the um, um, getting rid of all the material that is presently there. They're not processing anything, so all the material has to go. And then there are buildings and, and uh, tanks and all that that have to be uh, disassembled, cleaned, disassembled, and removed. Uh, then underneath those buildings has to be remediated. Nobody knows what's under the buildings and to the extent to which there is pollution. This affects the groundwater, and it also because they are right um, um, fronting on the bay, it affects what happens in all those sloughs and all those little creeks there. So um, the closure plan has to involve um, removing the physical buildings uh, and remediating the land. And, and getting it so it can be used by probably uh, industrial, commercial kind of thing. Okay, and Miriam, since we're running out of time really quickly, if you could just give us a web address for um, Youth United for Community Action so people can get more information. Okay, the web is www.youthunited.com, um, I think it is. I, I think it's .net. It's dot youth, net. Yeah, youth dot United net. Dot yeah. net. And the uh, and the phone number is six five zero three two two ninety one sixty five. And again, the number is six five zero three two two nine one six five for Youth United for Community Action. And Keisha, do you want to leave us a web address where people can get more info? Uh, not a web address, but a phone number for uh, Ujima Security Council is six five zero three two one ten zero nine. And email. Go ahead. Ujima E P A U J I M A E P A as in East Palo Alto at AOL dot com. Okay, well thank you very much. And thank that's you. all the time that we have for today's show. Thank you, Keisha Evans with the Ujima Security Council, and to Miriam Cruz with the uh, Youth United for Community Action for joining us, and to Erica Bridgman for being our engineer. This show and others are available from www.kpfa.org for your convenience. Thank you for listening. Have a great weekend. The artist you're listening to is Yan Miao, singing mantras she learned from her Tibetan grandmother, a spiritual master. Hear Miao herself 